This is Mr. York Baker 72, an agent operating in an enemy city. Tucked inside his overcoat is a complete transmitter receiver and power supply. Yesterday, a plane flew over this city on a routine reconnaissance mission and also served in the added capacity of radio contact for the agent who relayed to it his gathered intelligence. The special transmitter receiver unit installed in the plane not only handles the agent's traffic, but also records the entire conversation for future study so that the intelligence can be routed into proper action channels. Otherwise, the plane is apparently just another recon outfit. Nothing special, nothing suspicious. The agent's report recorded by the plane-borne unit can be later studied at an intelligence base by reproducing it on a wire recorder as illustrated in this sequence. Item one, your last bombing mission scored complete knockout. Plant production halted. Delay will continue at least three, I say again, three more weeks. Over. Roger, Roger, I understand. Over. Item two, one five zero, I say again, one five zero tank cars. Joan, the easily stored ground-based unit, is for its size an amazingly powerful high-frequency transceiver. The limitations of high-frequency transmission are employed in this operation to advantage. Its very short land range makes enemy monitoring almost impossible. However, in ground-to-plane contact, Voice transmission can be reliably received 30 miles away. Jones' layout is extremely light and simple. Total weight, three and one half pounds. The power supply consists of two A and two B batteries, neatly packed into a zipper case. The A batteries, standard one and a half volt flashlight cells, are wired in parallel and slip easily into their holders. The two 67 and a half volt B batteries are connected in series by snap fasteners. If these batteries are unavailable, any combination giving the same voltage, one and a half volts for the A and a total of 135 volts for the B can be used. When closing the case, the inside flap must be kept in place to prevent short circuiting. The collapsible dipole antenna is designed to provide peak sending and receiving efficiency. When Joan is properly held, the maximum signal strength is concentrated in a path directly in front of and behind the operator. An important point to observe when establishing contact. The small plastic earphones are molded to fit securely. The knob on the right permits variable receiver tuning. The one on the left, a sensitivity control, increases volume on weak reception. By merely pushing up the sliding switch on the side, the set becomes a transmitter. The operation is so simple that no special technical knowledge is necessary. Sending frequency is fixed, leaving nothing more to do but to start talking. This is the position that must be maintained to assure best reception. Eleanor, the airborne unit, operationally independent, consists of a trans receiver, wire recorder, antenna extension support, manual directional control, dynamotor, and power supply. Electrical supply is provided by four six-volt aircraft-type wet cell batteries stored in an insulated case. The battery lead is connected to the set by a Hubble twist-lock plug. The main power switch, fuse, and pilot light are located adjacent to the dynamotor, 
which steps up the electrical energy from 24 to 330 volts. Power is then fed directly into the trans receiver by heavy cable and a six-prong amphenol connector. The principal controls and connections are conveniently located on the trans receiver panel, the power supply connector, interphone receptacle, recorder level meter, tuning meter, antenna lead-in jack, selector switch, which enables the operator to use the interphone and radio circuit separately or simultaneously. The tuning dial, headphone jacks, microphone jack, and the manual headphone volume control. Five small holes on the side of the set permit screwdriver adjustment of volume from the operator's microphone, from the interphone to the operator or transmitter, to the wire recorder, to the interphone system, and from the receiver. Flipping this toggle switch starts the recorder. One spool of wire will handle over 60 minutes of traffic. The level winding mechanism must be aligned with the wire running off the feeder spool. The wire runs under the first spindle, over the grooved pulley, through the slot in the recorder head, over the next grooved pulley, under the spindle, and is taped onto the take-up spool, which turns counterclockwise. Threading is simpler if the recorder is removed from the baseboard. The antenna extension tube is adjustable. After the plane is in flight, the antenna may be lowered to its best operating position, which is about 30 inches below the plane's fuselage. By means of the manual control and azimuth indicator, directional antennas can be oriented. The four main types of antennas. This is the bi-directional dipole, similar to the one used with the Joan unit. It receives and transmits a stronger signal in the two directions broadside to its axis. For the best results, the cross arm must be perpendicular to the direction of desired transmission. The directive array antenna is unidirectional and must be pointed toward the ground station. Highly critical, a deviation of 30 degrees from the proper azimuth means loss of signal. However, this directional sensitivity has advantages. Concentrating the beam materially increases signal strength. Also, an Eleanor operator, by skillful orientation of this antenna, can establish the agent's approximate location and aid the navigator in setting his course. This is the omnidirectional type commonly referred to as the turnstile. It receives and transmits signals equally well in all directions. It is merely lowered into position and requires no further attention. The vertical rod, also omnidirectional, is at this time still undergoing trials. It requires a similar antenna on the Joan unit for best performance. Eleanor has been designed to operate in any plane equipped with a standard camera well. It is interchangeable with the aerial camera and can be installed or removed in a few minutes. These four brackets support the equipment and the slotted holes lock it firmly in position. On installations where the bracket holes are not slotted, Eleanor can be secured by bolts. To prevent damage from plane vibration, the baseboard floats on rubber shock mounts. 
Through the open doors in the well bottom, the lower section of the antenna is attached. The possibility of the plane's voltage fluctuating makes an independent power supply necessary. Sufficient cable is provided so that the battery case can be stowed conveniently to one side. The following procedure is recommended for making a proper ground check. After turning on the main power, push the three-way switch to the radio position. A hissing sound should be heard in the earphones, indicating that the set is operating. The key is then switched to interphone, which allows the operator to talk to members of the crew. The microphone is built into the oxygen mask and the push-to-talk remote control is easy to operate even with heavy gloves. He checks with the pilot, who acknowledges reception loud and clear. The key is then returned to the radio position to conduct tests with a Joan operator who is stationed a short distance from the plane. Great care must be taken with this phase of the ground check making certain that the transmission to and reception from Joan give peak performance. During reception, the needle should be constantly watched, making necessary compensations for frequency drift and to be certain that the receiver is always tuned for best reception. It is not only important that Joan's transmission be heard clearly by the Eleanor operator, but it also must be satisfactorily recorded. This control is provided by the recorder level meter, which registers the volume of input to the recorder. The recorder volume is adjusted by turning the screw inside the opening marked to recorder. When everything is properly balanced, the three-way key is turned to the both position. So set, the pilot and other designated crew members are hooked in on the Joan Eleanor circuit. The principal tests were made from an Eleanor-equipped B-17 operating out of bowling field. Although a B-24, British Mosquito, and Lockheed Lodestar were also employed. In each instance, the apparatus was easily installed and functioned successfully. The usable range has been established at 30 miles. However, contact has been affected at over twice that distance. There are several factors contributing to effective transmission. The altitude, atmospheric conditions, and location of ground station. Results are seriously affected when Joan is too close to automobiles too near concrete or metallic structures, or if operation is attempted from the floor of a steep valley. Ideal locations would be the roof of a building that is not surrounded by higher ones. A flat surface, a gentle rolling hill, and a small clearing surrounded by trees. The proximity of scattered trees is not a deterrent. The most revealing test was a run from the vicinity of Richmond, Virginia to New York City. From an altitude of 25,000 feet, contact was made with Washington, D.C., Philadelphia, and a spot near New York. It was prearranged that on approaching each city, the plane would send out a steady signal to establish ground contact. Two operators were stationed in Washington, one at Bowling Field, and the other in the city by a large building. The building location was unsatisfactory, but bowling field proved excellent. The Joan operator must hold the apparatus in the same spot with relation to his body. Shifting the antenna position changes the transmitting frequency and direction of signal. For best reception, talking should be in a normal tone, with the microphone about three inches from the face and the words spoken slowly and distinctly. The Joan operator at Philadelphia, uncertain from which direction the plane will approach, swings his antenna in a wide arc, 
It is essential that the operational schedule be mutually understood. Under difficult conditions, key words and figures must be repeated, and the necessary pauses for plain acknowledgement should always be used. To assure the handling of maximum traffic with greatest security, the ground operator should do most of the talking, but must break his transmission at least every 10 seconds for the plane's acknowledgement. The following playback of the Philadelphia contact illustrates the proper procedure for handling traffic. This is Sugar One Fox at Philadelphia. You are coming in here like a ton of bricks. Give location and reception report. Over. Sugar One Fox, this is Jake One Able. Roger. Your signal is loud and clear. We're about three five miles south of Philadelphia. Altitude two five thousand feet. Temperature minus three zero degrees. Proceed with your traffic. Over. Jig One Able. This is Sugar One Fox. Roger. Item one. Am operating from Fairmont Park on Small Hill overlooking city. Over. Roger. I understand. Over. Item two. Will phone Colonel Shore results of contact. While the plane was flying north across Philadelphia, ground contact was maintained for more than 20 minutes. The New York operator made a last minute change in plans and set up at Maplewood, New Jersey. Although he was then located 14 miles west of New York and the plane was not notified, contact was still satisfactory. A Joan-equipped operator relaying his information with dispatch offers an answer to the enemy's stiffening countermeasures against presently used methods. As additional agents are assigned to enemy strongholds, more and more Eleanor-equipped planes will take off to carry back vital intelligence data for our bombers. And in this new phase of intelligence reporting, an agent doing a solo rubs shoulders with the enemy one day and helps rub him out the next.